Hi, I'm Gavin Sign. And I'm Vivian Corrigan, and welcome to Perthshire Online TV. So how's your week been? Have you been getting lots of lovely compliments about your hairstyle? Do you know something? No, I haven't been, because I've been living so quietly these days. Oh, I don't and believe past, it. it. It's true, in the past week I've hardly been out at all, so there's not been that many compliments about the new, the new, the new look. The new look. <laughs> not just the new hairstyle, but the new look. <laughs> so tell me, listen, are you, um, from last week's show, are you registered for the Perth Kilt Run? No, I haven't. Not yet. But between you and me, I hear there's going to be a Perthshire online team going in for it. So that'll wipe the smile off your face. Oh, it's wiped the smile <laughs> off my face completely. That's a great, a great idea. It's a good idea. Um, yeah, great idea. Yeah. Oh, geez, another, another, another um, big effort for <laughs> me actually challenge. moving forward. <laughs> big challenge. Um, thanks to all our viewers for the great feedback on um, last week's show. Um, thank you for all your news um, that's popping through as well. And um, yeah, that's great. Please, please continue to, to keep in touch with us. So what's on the show this week, Vivian? Well, I had a catch up with Tayside Police's Jim Smith about a very serious subject of domestic violence, something that we hear a lot of really in the media on a day-to-day -day basis. On a different subject entirely, I chatted with Stephen Clark, our resident fitness expert, not about your waistline online challenge, you and Elaine, <laughs> but this time about fitness facts and myths, although some say it is a myth that you've been seen running around the North Inch. Do you know something? You're so cheeky to me. I still get to get my own back on that. On you that will. Co what was it? The, the slightly chubby co-presenter, which right. everybody made comment on last week. That was um, all over Facebook, it wasn't was it? was all over Facebook. <laughs> um, this week, Alan caught up with the, um, the author, Jess Smith. And um, Jess has written some fabulous, fabulous books, um, which have a, um, a subject matter around her travelling folk background. It was also London Fashion Week last week, but, you know, we in Perthshire have our own um, fashion leaders as well. Well, and I was delighted that we had Tracy Miller from Mac and Posh in the studio, who was given an overview of um, the uh, ladies' fashions for the next season. Very good. And I also chatted with Perth's very own Charlie Taylor, and that was really lovely. I enjoyed talking to her about the latest trends for spring, summer um, this year. So that was really good, really, really enjoyable. And um, please remember to listen to our Heartland FM uh, radio programme. That's on a Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock and repeated on a Thursday at 10pm. We're also interested to hear from any community groups in Perthshire. If you'd like to have a feature on our Perthshire Online TV show, or perhaps you're actually looking for your own regular show on the Perthshire Online TV channel. So please do get in touch with us if you're a community group in Perthshire and you'd like to, to broaden, your, broaden your audience. And as they say, it's on with this week's show. Welcome to this week's Persia Online TV News Round. Tayside Police are appealing for witnesses regarding the murdered for TV at pensioner Janet Medvin. There were a number of passengers on the number 17 stagecoach bus which, which travelled between Dunning and Perth at around 10.30am on Monday, February the 20th. They will have passed Mrs Medvin's cottage at Kildinney Farm. Inquiry officers want to speak to the occupants of that bus and would appeal to them to come forward. A man, has been, a man was seen walking a brown-coloured dog on the road out of Fertiviet, leading towards the level crossing at about 10.30am on Monday, February the 20th as well. Tayside Police want to speak with that man. A yellow agricultural forklift vehicle was seen travelling eastwards on the road from Fertiviet towards Forgandeni. It passed Mrs Medvin's cottage also about 10.30am on Monday, February the 20th. And again, police want to speak to the driver of that vehicle as they may have information useful to inquiries. On a different note, Perth and Kinross Council would like to advise that there is no interruption to cardboard recycling services at Inveramond, further to the recent serious fire, so don't stop your recycling trips to the Inveramond site. On tourism, some of Perthshire's top resort hotels and Perth and Kinross Council have collaborated on a new film that will showcase the area's environmental tourism credentials to audiences throughout the UK and internationally. The film shows the excellent work being done at Perthshire's major, major resort destinations to ensure that their businesses are as sustainable and environmentally friendly as possible. The project is the work of the Perthshire Green Resorts Group, an informal initiative comprising the Glen Eagles Hotel, Creef Hydro, Duchale Hotel and Country Estate, Hilton, Hilton Dunkeld House Hotel, Athol Palace Hotel and the Green Tourism Business Scheme. The group is coordinated by Perth and Kinross Council. 
Good news for our viewers in Blair Gowrie and East Perthshire. Library members can now enjoy free broadband at Blair Gowrie Library. The library in Leslie Street now has wireless hotspots installed, allowing library members with Wi-Fi enabled devices to simply walk in and get a fast and free connection to the internet. It was announced last week that the new National Fire and Rescue Service will have its interim headquarters based in Perth. This will have great potential economic development opportunities for the area moving forward and hopefully attract further bodies to be headquartered in the area. We like to hear of new businesses starting up, so congratulations to locals Damien Houston and Steve Brown who've recently launched a new online estate agency called It's a Home. You can find them on www.itsahome.co.uk. And one of the exciting things as part of their launch is the fact that they are waiving commission of the first 25 sales to build their brand awareness. So best wishes to Damien and Steve. The finals of the National Best Bar None Awards take place this week and we wish the Loft, the Tor Tams and the Old Ship Inn the best of luck. And we move to what's on. Well, Wednesday the 29th of February, Perthshire Chamber of Commerce are hosting an evening networking event as part of their rural roadshows with Perth and Conross Council's David Littlejohn. The event is at Aberfeldy at the House of Menzies. Sunday the 11th of March sees Blue Thistle Weddings Wedding Fair at Balathy House Hotel. It's a lovely setting for the event. Friday the 30th of March, in the evening, there's a Rolling Back the Years disco in the Grampian Hotel. Music is all the way from the 60s and the event is in aid of Rachel House Charity. You can find details on Facebook on the Added Sparkle Wedding and Events page. The 31st of March sees the start of the Shrinking Thinking Weight Management Programme at the lovely Garden Retreat at Kilgraston School. You can find Shrinking Thinking on Facebook for more information. And importantly, don't forget the Perth Kilt Run on Saturday the 2nd of June. Organiser Steve Bonthrone is looking for your registrations right now. Go to www.perthkiltrun.co.uk Domestic abuse is a sad fact of life. And I'm joined by Detective Inspector Jim Smith from the Public Protection Unit who has come in to discuss this with us. Hello Jim. Good morning. Nice to have you. So, this goes unreported a lot of the time, doesn't it? That's correct. Like you say, it's a sad fact of life. Um, there, <coughs> excuse me, there's a number of individuals out there who are uh, suffering from domestic abuse. They're coming forward on occasions and telling us, but there's a number of others who, for whatever reason, don't feel they have the confidence to come forward and report what's actually happened to them. Right. Now, they should have the confidence because you have a whole team dedicated to this, don't you? Tell us about that. Absolutely. I mean, Tayside Police are committed to dealing with domestic abuse, along with our partner agencies. My unit are um, daily de dealing with victims of domestic abuse. We have a domestic abuse officer who works uh, co-located with uh, our Bernardo's colleagues. I have two dedicated detective constables who are highly trained to deal with serious, serious and violent crime and apply those techniques to investigate domestic abuse to bring the perpetrator uh, to justice. Right. Now, why do you find in your experience that people don't report this? Now, we're talking, it's primarily women that are affected, isn't it? Women with children. Absolutely. I mean, the statistics say that there is occasionally a male victim of domestic abuse. That's in the minority. It is mainly uh, female victims. There's a number of reasons why they won't come forward and report it whether it's uh, an embarrassing factor because it's, it's now out in the public domain or the, the perpetrator's the main earner in the family and they might lose their family home, their children, you know, if there's children in the, in the dynamics, social services may get involved or will get involved. There's a whole, whole, whole raft of reasons. We, we need to deal with those uh, concerns and, get, and make sure that people are aware that we will deal with these things sensitively. Yeah. You know, it's not a case of you report it to us and we'll be taking your children from you or, you know, there's a whole raft of things that we can put in place to protect them and make sure that we can bring this horrible situation to a resolution. Because unfortunately you often see the other side of things where things haven't been dealt with and it ends in a very serious situation. So you want to get people help before that happens, don't you? Absolutely. Prevention is the key to this. You know, if we're getting reporting coming in, we can get interventions in early, either it's with, with the police or our partner agencies, to get the support mechanisms in place, mechanisms in place, to help the individuals. Like you say, sadly that you know um, domestic abuse does happen, and the, the, the other end of the, the, the um, spectrum is that we can end up with a homicide. Yeah. That is what I want to try and stop stop occurring. Yeah. We've got risk assessments that we take that, that we do daily. 
However, you know, it does happen, yeah. but prevention is the key for me. And also, this is not acceptable. That's really what you're saying, isn't it? That this has gone on. I mean, you know, it's gone on for many, many um, decades, you could say, or and, and even longer domestic abuse. But in today's society, this is not acceptable, is it? Absolutely. That's the key, key message I want to get across to the people that are suffering from this, but also the people that are aware that it might be happening to somebody that they know. It's not acceptable. My organisation are quite clear on that. Uh, we will deal with it robustly. Um, you know, it's, it's gone on for years, but you know we are, we're dealing with it differently. It's about education. Yeah. The police deal with it uh, far more robustly now than what we did previously, and we also have our, our links to our, our partner agencies to put in the support to to help the individuals and the children and, and make sure that they're getting the help that they need. Yeah, because this isn't just, I mean, it, you know, years ago it used to be a, a domestic and the police didn't get involved. But that's not the case now, is it? Laws have changed. Uh, absolutely. Our, our whole ethos about domestic abuse is quite clear. It's, it's one of the, the, the key priorities for, uh, for my organisation and across, across Scotland. The, the way we used to deal with domestics, police officers would uh, attend, remove the perpetrator, and that was the, the, sh the short-term solution. That doesn't work in the long term, so we now deal with it on a multi-agency basis. Uh, you know, we, we deal with the crisis situations there and then, but we're looking at the long term, what's best for the, the, the individuals, for the children, and the perpetrator. You know, yeah. we can we can make referrals to other agencies to help them with their, whatever it is that's triggering the, the domestic abuse. So, if someone does find themselves in a situation, how can they get in touch then? I mean, obviously, a crisis situation, it would be a 999 call, but um, say someone has got time to think about what's happening. D definitely. You know, don't, don't think that they're going to uh, bother us by making a 999 call. I'd prefer that than they don't phone us. There is a national uh, domestic abuse helpline number, which is man. You know, there's somebody at the end of a phone, 24 7, contact that number. That there's internet. Um, you know, our partner agencies, Women's Aid, uh, Tayside Police, we all, have, we all have links to domestic abuse and they're safe means of, of contacting us. If you're on the internet and you're on the domestic abuse webpage, there's a quick, uh, quick close button and it, it, it wipes off the trace of any, any contact, wow. which, you know, is, is again a, a support for the victim that if they're, if they're finding, researching and finding out the contacts, if the perpetrator comes back into the house, click of a button and it it clears the history. Very good. You know, so there's a lot of things that we've moved on quite quite yes. considerably, but there's room to, to keep pushing and, and get this done. Uh, Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about this very serious issue. And if you are a victim of domestic abuse or know someone who is, then the message is to tell someone and seek help. Now, Perthshire has a wealth of creative people, whether it's potters or cr uh, crafters or artists, but we've also got lots of writers, and I've got one in the studio with me today. Welcome to the studio, Jess Smith. Thank you. Now, Jess has written five books all together, and uh, the, basically the first three books kind of summarise your life and your experiences as a, a traveller or a gypsy or a tinker. We'll discuss that in a while, which is the right word and that. And, uh, and you've put those, and you've also got a novel and you've also got a collection of sh small stories that uh, came from being just oral stories and you've put them into, into text now. So, Jess Smith, who are you? Where did you start? Well, my memory, I was born in Aberfeldy, yeah. in the Cottage Hospital in 1948. But my first memory as a wee travelling lassie mm -hmm. was when my mother had just had her eighth daughter. She was, uh, we were living up at Lockery in a sort of a show wagon thing, and my memory serves me right. And she had boiled a big bath over a, an outside fire, and she was scrubbing her nappies. Mm -hmm. Hippins, that's what they used to be the called. Hippins. The hippins, yeah. And she was scrubbing her, her nappies, and I can remember her. Uh, she was on her knees, and she had a, a scrubbing board and a, a bar of carbolic soap, and I can still hear the crrrr, you know, the carbolic soap on, on the So you had music board. even at that age? Absolutely. And I saw a bus coming over the, the bridge at the tunnel, yeah. and I said, Mom, Mama, look, here's a bus coming. No, 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 Jess, she says, the bus goes through Pitlockery. I says, Mom, I see the bus coming. So, of course, this bus came in to Walkersfield, it was, and drove right up to our campsite and uh, out jumped my father. And I'll remember him to this day, a big cold marmot bonnet, and he was always shoving it to the back of his head. 
and he said, Ginny, he went right up to my mother and he says, look what I've brought you. He lifted her up with the elbows and he turned her around and he says, now look at that, isn't that a lovely home? And she looked at it and she put her hair out of her <laughs> eyes and she says, you can put it back where you got it because I'm not living in that. <laughs> well, do you know, Alan, that was our home. For mm. the next 10 years, that was my home and that's who I am. So you had like a, like a single deck of bus and you went, uh -huh. where, where, where did you kind of travel with that? Well, we had to stop for the winter, you know, it was, it was imperative. In fact, it was the law that we had to stop for the winter because the Education Act uh, mm -hmm. deemed all children from uh, nomadic people, wherever they were in Britain, had to go to school. Yeah. Travellers had to go to school for 100 days or 200 half days. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was, we had to stop. But when April came, when the yellow was on the broom, we were away. <laughs> we were away. Freedom. So you spent most of the time touring all around Scotland? Yes, mainly the West Coast, but of course we had to make a living. So my father had his contacts with farmers to gather brock wool, you know, mm -hmm. and, and he had a, a, um, a contact with selling that. That put food on the table. My mother did her hawking. She had baskets and in the basket she would put thread and, and um, you know, older people will remember the travellers knocking on the door and selling their, their wares. Buttons, little buttons and things like that and needles and little um, okay. things like that. And I used to go with her sometimes, but usually, you know, I, I was out there, I, I was sitting and looking at the, the ferries sailing across the water, you know, from Oban to Mull. And, and I was up in the trees and, you know, shinning from the silver birch tops one so to the other. So you basically had a fantastic childhood. I had the most brilliant childhood. So the, the three books that you've written, it's a, it's a trilogy. If you can just take us briefly through each book and what, what they cover. Well, Jesse's journey uh, starts. That's this one here. Yes, starts with uh, that that day, age five, yes. and it takes uh, it takes me through to age fifteen when the bus was, um, you know, was finished. It was dead. It was my yeah. father. Is that you was, on the front? Yeah, that's me, age three. I won't tell you what I'm doing in the grass. Okay, you'll have to three, read about that. <laughs> when you're three, you can do that. So that takes you up to fifteen. Now the second book. Is this one tales? Uh, no, tales, uh, tales from the tent. That's the second one. Tales from the one. tent. Yeah. So that's that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And where does that take you? Then? Well, that takes me f um, briefly from uh, fifteen to seventeen, where into I met my husband. But yes. it's mainly tales. You know, it was very important to collect those tales because they were going away to the grave with the older travellers. Now you have a funny story of how you met your husband. Yeah. yeah. Is that an unusual way? Do you want to take us through that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I suppose I was one of the early hippies. Um, it it was the early 60s and uh, we were banning, lots of people banning the bombs and things like that. Yeah. And I was heading to London to ban the bomb when I went in to see my mother and father. They were living in a residential caravan. And she says, where are you going? I said, we're to London to ban the bomb. Oh, she says, don't stand too near the bombs. They'll go off, they'll blow you to bits. I says, well, this is a big bomb, ma'am. And she says, well, before you go, will you go to the wee shop and get me some shopping, get me some messages? So mm. I took her basket and I took her, her list and I skipped along. And you know, when you're like that and you're banning everything, the brass burn, the, there's a big poppy somewhere in your hair and you're all floppy, <laughs> Jesus sandals on your feet, bare feet. And I came out of the wee shop and I didn't notice the box of turnips that was sitting at the, the side of the shop and I jarred my toe under one of these boxes and I went all my length. And when I picked myself up, uh, you know, the, uh, there's a bag of sugar split over a pair of winkle picker shoes and I, I ran my eyes from the toe all the way up to this handsome guy and, uh, and that was it. That was your husband? That was him, yeah. That's, that's almost like it came out of a movie. It happened. I can happened, see you being yeah. played by Nicole Cl no. Kidman. <laughs> Anyway, that's that's kind of the two years from when you met your husband, etc. Then you've got this one here, which is well, I'm tears married. for a tinker. In that one, I'm married, yes. and, and we have our children. And I use the word tinker with the greatest respect because mm -hmm. a lot of travellers don't like the word tinker. They think it's derogatory. Sometimes um, uh, gypsy, they think that as well. But I felt that tinker was a craft. And it was important to use that title for the respect of these el these craftsmen who'd passed on. Okay. Then you've got this next, you brought a novel out next. Yeah, I brought this novel out because um, when I was a young girl, teenager, I used to say to my mother, you know, why did Mrs. So-and-so look so unhappy and why is Mrs. So-and-so always dressed in black? And she says, oh, well, her husband never came back from the war. And I says, but yeah, but lots of other women, you know, in, in the settled population. She says, yes, but that awful telegram never reached her and she had to find out in other ways. And some of them were still looking 
still looking for their husbands and oh, or sons. So they never actually knew whether their they husband or son out. had died or not? Yeah, never found out. Oh, and that's that book all about that. And I believe it's a, about a journey. I yeah. believe a copy of that has been sent to, is it? To Peter Jackson. Peter Jackson. Zealand, so you yeah. never know, it may be a movie one day. Oh, Alan, you know, when he finishes with his hobbits, yeah. When he's yeah. finished with his hobbits, yeah. <laughs> so your final book, I know you've got another book coming out, but this is your final book that's been published, and this is... Um, What's it called? Sukin Berries. Sukin Berries. Yeah, yeah. My older sister, she, she, I phoned her up because I had decided to write stories, that the oral stories for children. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, you can any age can read them, but I thought it was important to gather as much. Of, they're, they're all through yeah. the books. There's myths and legends in all the books, as, uh, and even in the novel. But that one, I had to get a, a complete book of stories for, for people to so, keep. So basically all the stories that are in these, this book is what you heard as a child but it was all passed down by oral talk. Still hearing. Still, yeah, hearing. still hearing. But you've decided now to put them all into this book so we can all share them. I'll yeah. talk to you in a minute as well. I just want to go through your things because you've got some inter interesting theories about travellers and that. But anyway, you've also then brought out this CD that also has songs on too. Yeah, I, I, I recorded the CD for people whose um, sight was failing them and they had memories of the travellers, they had mm -hmm. stories themselves, but they couldn't read the books and I felt, well, that, that, was, that was, you know, I lost my aim that way, so I yes. thought I'll put it onto a CD, then they can listen to it and hopefully enjoy it. And it's interesting because you believe that a lot of the traditions as a, a gypsy when you as a child are now being lost, so that's why it's so important for you to write these down. Is that true? You know, it is. It, 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 I suppose the words progression um, and the travellers, the culture of the travellers, especially with the crafts, you know, they worked mm -hmm. it in, they wove baskets, uh, everything that they did was with their hands and, and that's obsolete now. You know, it's difficult for the young travellers to actually associate with their background because they, they've sort of moved into the modern world, the techno yeah. world. And, uh, and, and there's so much to preserve, and I think that's why, you know, um, and many other reasons that I felt it was important to, to get everything in books uh, before I leave. Is there, a, is there a big difference between the different gypsies or travellers around the country, Irish travellers, Welsh, Scottish, yeah. English? Is there different kind of cultures within cultures? There is, there is a, a, a difference, a big difference, and you know, and if you were to speak to each, each one from each group, you would see that the Irish have a, they 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 sort of live in the past, you know. Okay. Uh, they they live, the, and I can say that because my my mother and father's people both came over during the famine, so we have a, an Irish um, strong Irish link, and uh, also the culture, a lot of Irish culture in, in our, our um, historical links. The English are more refined. They have a a, a more they they're more into um, um, gold and and ornaments, you know. That you can see that in, mm -hmm. in the way they dress and such as. And then again, the northern uh, traveller is more is more burler. Bur uh, it's um, like an old Gallic way, you know, the Western okay. and that. They, ha they have their ways, and uh, yes, they, yeah, they are distinctive in their own way. Yeah. Now, I believe you're working on a, a sixth book, mm. and that's very interesting because it takes gypsies right back to the early, to, from where they began, and you've got your you've had it. Well, yeah, tell us about the, it. Well, the way of the wanderer is uh, has always it's always been with me ever since I real um, when when I know an old fella who was working in Loch Gilpid, he was doing the tin. He was actually making a colander for the minister's wife. I remember he said that, and he shooed me away. And I says, "Who are we?" And he says, "Oh, you're the lassie that stays up in that bus." No, no, no. Who are we really? Where do we belong? Why is it, you know, that there's always someone in school spits in me and throws things at me? What is the problem with us? And he said, they don't understand us, and we have a history, and we have a religion, we keep it all in our head, and we've never shared it. And he says, we're the Cairdridge. And I says, the Cairdridge, what does that mean? It meant nothing to me. But it was the bubble that made me research and continue, and I'm still researching it. It's like unraveling the digestive tract of a long dead dinosaur to try and find all these these links to actually what what is and what has been proven um, are people from Bible tribes. From, from the, the old, Bible tribes. Before the Bible, the ancient, where the Bible comes from, the desert tribes. There okay. were people called Hiscus that, that actually occupied Egypt and they were called the, the desert princes and they introduced the horse and the chariot to the Egyptians. And uh, they had 108 kings, and, and one of their, their, their gods was the god of storm, and also the god of metal, and the god of um, the battle axe. And, 
And I find a lot of links to that. You know, as I go through uh, and study the old gypsy books, I find there's lots of links to these ancient people. And strangely enough, Seth uh, and Reshef, the Egyptian god, they wore kilts and <coughs> they actually had long beards. And if you think about the old um, Scottish image of the Highlander, you actually mm -hmm. see that, that there. So, yeah, there is a link. You know, we're, we're all Jock Thompson's bairns and none of us really oh, okay. know where we're from. Well, listen, let's bring it right up to, the, uh, right up to now. So what do you think of the uh, big fat gypsy wedding? Do you know, I, my mother brought me and my seven sisters, eight of us up. We didn't have any brothers. Mm -hmm. Never, no matter how awful a thing portrays itself, look for the good. Yeah. And the seed in the big fat gypsy wedding, I mean, I don't even think Walt Disney would have went with dresses like that. I mean, that was just, it was, it, it was lovely, beautiful, and people do what they do, bless them. But to me, who, who got married in a, a cheap suit, <laughs> a little wood suit, <laughs> in the Registrar and Hogmanay in their birth, um, and I'm still with the same man, you know, that, that's just the way these people are. They, they like doing that. Um, but personally, I, I, I don't, you know, so we are different. Mm. And uh, sorry, I've lost the thread. Oh, don't worry, Chuck. You're <laughs> talking about the uh, the big fat gypsy weddings and yeah, the dresses. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, well, well. But what I saw in that program was that at long last, the outside world took a camera inside these caravans, mm -hmm. and they saw just how clean these people exactly. are. Exactly. And uh, and that's what I saw. And I also listened to the young, and and all our future, no matter where we're from is in the head of the young. So um, I was good to hear the youngster's opinion about the, the outside world mm. and that. So that's what and, I got. And, and finally, I just want to clear up traveller, tinker, gypsy. When I was a child, a gypsy had a mystery about it and it was exotic and it was like fantastic. It, wasn't, it didn't have any bad associations when I was a child. Mm. It seemed to be as I grew, grew up, it's, they seemed to come in more. And then nowadays, you don't have to say, because of the political correct, I, I, quite, I like the word gypsy. I don't associate that with anything bad. And, but sometimes I'm kind of glared at if I use that word. I say, mm. no, you should use the word traveller. What, what, what's your opinion? Well, again, this is the digestive tract of the dinosaur again. Egyptians, there was an act against the Egyptians uh, that was laid down by nearly every king from, you know, Henry, James, mm -hmm. Anne and Queen, that there was something terribly, terribly wrong with these people. Now, what I've discovered is <coughs> that they had their own religion, and that was the only thing that was against them. Now, if you take the Enlightenment, the time of the Enlightenment when John Knox and Cromwell was, was, was on the go, anything that did fit in with the Bible was an enemy of God mm -hmm. and the gypsies didn't fit in with with what was written and, and if you look at the Bible that there, there are passages that say have nothing to do with necromancers have nothing to do with fortune tellers and palm readers and that is exactly how the, the gypsy made their living you know innocently it was a, a pa passed down through their generations so they never had a good press from the church nor the state, actually. And it's always been a battle for survival. So they had to keep changing their, their identities mm. and their names. I mean, there was gypsy slavery long before there was, was um, African slavery. So they've, ha they've had a bad time, you know, and they're still mm. here, like the fox, you know, they still survive. <laughs> listen, see. Jess, it's been fantastic talking to you. I could listen to you all day. Thanks for coming on the show. I honestly could listen to you all day. Thanks <laughs> Thank a lot, Thank you Chuck. for asking me. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. You're welcome. Fairways provide cost-effective HR support from contracts to recruitment, health and safety to training. Fairways, working with you, for you. Visit fairways-uk.com or call Perth 632 561 for a free consultation. I did it Fairways. Just as fashion changes with the seasons, so does hair and beauty. And I'm thrilled to be joined by salon owner and three-time Scottish hairdresser of the year, Charlie Taylor, who's coming to talk to us about what is hot for spring, summer 2012. So welcome, Charlie, to the show. It's lovely to have you. Thank you. Now, I know that you've been to this fantastic hair show in Prague recently. Tell us about that. What's, what's on for I this? I have indeed. Yeah. I think one of the best things about the hairdressing and beauty industry is the fact that every season it does change. It's probably one of the things I like about it most. And um, this season came up with some absolutely fantastic um, hairstyles. Funnily enough, not a lot of them are new. Right. No surprises there. So because, revivals maybe? Yes, and it's, it's not about reinventing the wheel, it's just about bringing things back in a slightly different way. So this season the bob is appearing in 
all shapes and sizes and all colours. Right. So there is pretty much a bob out there to suit everybody. Because often people think the bob is quite a difficult one to, to wear, don't they? And you've got to have a certain face and certain shape. Yes, that's right. But I think I think the varieties of bob now are, are huge. I mean, there's the classic bob with the fringe and the straight down the side. And there are certain face shapes that would suit that right. and certain ones that wouldn't. Um, but also there are bobs that can be um, layered, short fringes, long fringes, sweeping fringes. So pretty much there is a bob that can suit most people, and I would say. And long hair, is that still okay? Well, actually, that, I would say that would be the other main... We're both sitting here with yes, long I hair. <laughs> uh, I would say that would actually be the other main thing for this season yet again, is that long hair... Hair that can be transferred into something quite glamorous. So there were lots of waves, curls, quite a lot of curls. But again, the whole shiny, healthy hair, yeah. curls, glamour, it was all there. Very, very exciting. And, and what about ex hair extensions? Is that still...? Well, hair extensions are popular. Mm -hmm. um, however, hair extensions you have to be very careful with because you can do damage with them. Right. It is they aren't cheap to have done. Hair right. extensions are expensive and it's worth paying for to have really good quality hair. But of course they are still popular because not everyone's got long hair. That's and as long as the glamour hair thing is around, people are going to want a quick fix to get there. Yeah. You yeah. know, so well, if you started off with a bob last season and you want glamorous long hair this yeah. season, there's only one way to do it. Yeah. Well, I've you got know? no intention of cutting mine at the moment, so... Well, good, um, I'm glad to hear that. I know, it is nice. And with long hair, you can do a lot with it as well, can't you? Yes, you can, and I think that probably is the difference, is that, that consumers, as in our customers, are getting better and better at doing their own hair. Mm -hmm. So if you've got long hair, you can have it straight one day, curly the next, and, you know, if you're going out at night, do something different again. So it's great. And what about colours? What colours were, were really popular at the show? Well, we've got to remember this is spring, summer 2012. Yeah. So always through the seasons when we're coming into spring, summer, we're talking about lots of blondes. Good. Lucky for <laughs> I'm you. I'm glad to hear that. I wish. I've got my wee blonde bit, but that's as much as I've got. But blondes are always exciting for spring, summer. So, you Would know. They're a little bit different in the shades. Yes, yeah. there were lots of peachy and apricoty tones to the blonde. So right, where it's soft. gone, yes, where it's gone from in wintertime, it was icy, cool blondes. Now the blondes are much, much warmer. And I think it just associates itself well with spring, summer. Um, but on the flip side, for those of us who are brunettes, yes. and are never going to be blonde, <laughs> there's always got to be something for us. And there were lots of very, very rich burgundies, and coppers and the wonderful thing about that is the fantastic shine that comes from the hair yeah. um, and so you know it's it's great to see that these colors are around because and it's healthy isn't it, it it's looks healthy. it's healthy shiny hair and as a hairdresser myself i'm very very passionate about that yeah. i like to see people with good healthy hair Lovely. very important now when we think about celebrity cuts because people do follow celebrities don't they yes now, years ago it used mm -hmm. to be the rachel from friends cut that yes. everybody wanted yeah. didn't they yeah. so what about now what's what sort of end? yeah well i mean you know the rachel from friends cut that was around for a long long long, yeah. long time and it, in reality it's still there yeah. in various guises and she's different got lengths. A bob now. Yeah, she does, she does. So but there are other people who have crept in the mix. I mean I think Victoria Beckham has always had a little bit of an in there. Mm -hmm. She went from having long hair to having the pob, which was the posh bob. Yeah. And then, you know, people are watching because she's back now to having long hair. Mm -hmm. And she's very much involved in the fashion and the catwalk now. That's and right. so people do keep an eye on what she's doing with her hair. And likewise, her husband, yes, <laughs> David right. Beckham's hair is always looked at. However, there are some other key people like Cheryl Cole. I mean, she's been doing lots of adverts on television for hair. Yes. So her hair is a major celebrity feature. Mm -hmm. And she does go down that glamorous hair extensions, uh, you know, warm colours, shine. So she's a pretty good role model for hair, I would say. And then... For the sort of the the younger group of people, Lauren Conrad um, from the Hills, uh, lots of people comment on her hair. She's middle parting, waves down the side. Very soft. Yeah, yeah, very beautiful, very nice. So. And for the yeah. older older customer. Well, do you know what? And good honour, Lulu. Uh huh. 
if I hear at least once a day in our salons, at least once a day, somebody saying, do you know what, I really like Lulu's hair, the way it kind of flicks out and it's yeah. quite soft and feminine and covers quite a reasonable age group. Yeah. So it could be someone younger, it could be someone slightly older and it just is quite a flattering yes, hairstyle. It is. And That's the bottom line, it's flattering. She looks fantastic. I mean, well, she, she does. really does look amazing, doesn't she? Yeah, so, she does. So yeah. there's a few people out there pioneering great hair. Yeah. Now you mentioned you. men and you said David Beckham. Yes. Now we've had a We've got a bit of a star of our own, haven't we? And we uh, you've given him a bit of a makeover. <laughs> so I, yes. Gavin, yes. who, I mean, he has been working so hard on our, our Waistline Online Challenge. Good for and him. Um, we've got a bit of a before and after shot, so I think we can have a look at that now. There he is before. Um, so he's, you know, grey and distinguished, I would say. <laughs> and if we go to the, the new shot of what you've done to him, look at that. Well. Wow. wow! Doesn't he look amazing, Italian stallion? Absolutely. <laughs> I think he's rather pleased with himself, don't I know, you? I to be honest, though, I mean, I know I'm cool as like, but I think he looks amazing. He really does look amazing. And you can see he's lost weight. Yes. And I think the yes. darker haircut, I definitely think it's knocked years off him. Well, there you go. Well done. Job done. You're not just a hairdresser, you're a magician. <laughs> <laughs> Job done. <laughs> Fantastic. That's super. So. Just moving on now about um, when people do come in with photographs of a celebrity or a haircut that they've seen, um, that must pose a challenge for you to reproduce it, for them to kind of get what they think is going to suit them. Yeah, but you know, interestingly enough, if a client comes in with a photograph, mm -hmm. it's actually quite a good opening gambit because the client is then saying, right, this is the image that I have in my mind. And then hopefully they're looking for the hairdresser to either say, well, actually, yes, I think you would look fabulous with that. Or it is an opportunity for the hairdresser to say, look, do you know what? I'm not quite sure that that's going to suit the shape of your face. Or perhaps you don't have the hair type to go with that hairstyle. So I don't actually mind photographs because right. it means that there's an image there that makes it quite clear what the client's looking for. Right, and do and you then, find that they, they assume that you know what's in their head? I mean, is that quite difficult? Sometimes yes, sometimes yes, but the, the majority of clients now are quite well educated. It's not like years ago where clients didn't know what could be done to their hair. Clients now come in well educated about what suits them. Some don't, yeah. some don't, and then therefore those are the clients that are saying, actually, I have no idea what suits me. I've come to you so that you can tell me. And then, believe me, I'm not backwards and coming yes. forwards. I'm like, right, well, this is what I think yeah. you'd look great with, you know, yeah. just as I did with Gavin. Yeah. So, you know, it, it's, it's as long as the communication channels are open, everybody should end up with the right hairstyle. Yeah, and realistic, you know. And realistic, yeah. of course, because at the end of the day, it, it's got to be manageable. Yeah. Nobody wants a hairstyle that you've got to spend hours on. It's got to it's got to be effective, look good, and it's got to be quick. That's true. Now, there's so many products now, isn't there, um, that for, to suit all hair types. Now, you've brought some products in with you, um, just to, to talk ourselves through some of these. Um, yes, this indeed. This one here, the Moroccan oil. Now, this is amazing because I've used this myself and it really is good, especially for longer hair, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think, again, it's one of the great things about this whole hairdressing and beauty industry, if you like, that there's always something new. And I have to, I have to say, I always kind of sit there and think, I wish I'd invented that. There's always something that we get particularly excited about. Yeah. So, I mean, I'll just go through a couple of them. I mean, Moroccan oil, for example, I mean, this is an amazing product. A lot of people think that when you mention the word oil, that it would make hair greasy and oily. And in actual fact, this doesn't. This is an argan oil. And literally, you take a few drops of this product, rub it through your hands, rub it into your hair, and it sinks straight away under the surface of the hair. And it's just amazing, yeah. ongoing, what it does. It, it, if you use it every day, yeah. it is amazing. And you get a nice shine with oh, it. Oh, yeah. shine, control, it's absolutely a fantastic, a real hero product, that actually. Now, the other hair product you've brought in, what's that? Oh, this is my magic. Is this it? is my little bottle of magic. This product actually is called Perfect Hair. And the way I would tell one of my customers about this, one of my clients, would be that this for me is like hair in a bottle. So anybody who has damaged hair, so say for example you have a lot of highlights or a lot of colour in your hair and the hair obviously is going to be slightly damaged by that, 
This is like putting keratin, which is what the hair is made of, straight back into the hair. So it just comes out in a pump, in a mousse form, you scrunch it into the hair, it conditions and it actually penetrates into the structure of the hair. Lovely, thank amazing, you very much, Charlie. amazing. You can have it. <laughs> you can have it. It. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it's just oh, oh, amazing. Very good. So there is it's all so about many, results there, for me. There's it's so all about many results. products, though, isn't there? And do you do you think that is important that people do get the right product for their hair? Or I mean, this the family shampoo in the shower room. I mean, is that oh well? Okay you know, or? there's this huge debate. There will be a certain amount of people out there that just think that it doesn't matter, you know. But you know, for someone who sees results every day of life, I know that it does matter and. Generally, you get what you pay for in life, and so it's all about quality and what's actually in the product. And so, you know, our job really as as hairdressers, you know, all over the world, is to advise people on what's right for their hair type. Yeah. There's lots of people out there using the wrong products for the wrong hair type, and then they don't get results. Yeah, you I know, think that's so true. It is absolutely, and at the end of the day, it is all about getting the right result. Everybody wants the hair to look its best, and so therefore you have to be using the right sort of products. Right. Now, talking about products, mm -hmm. um, because we're, we're not just talking about hair products, mm -hmm. um, we've got the samples here of different nail products as well, Yes. Um, because that is huge business, isn't it? Nails have really just taken off over the last little while. I mean, uh, Vivian, it is really, myself, yes, so. and we, we all are, you know, it's quite incredible given that this is a time of recession, isn't yeah. it? And I think what has happened is that to have your nails done has still still comes under the category of being a, an affordable luxury. Yeah. So where people might maybe do without a new dress or whatever, you know, or wear the same dress they wore last year, whatever, having their nail done makes people feel good, but it's not a huge outlay. Yeah. And I think that's why in the last year there have been some major, major fantastic things coming out with nails, yes. really exciting. I mean, we just never stop doing nails at the moment. It's absolutely brilliant. Now, you've brought in some fantastic samples here. Now, I've got a red shellac on myself just now. Yes. Um, now, these three that you're going to highlight, um, talk us through these. Yes. Different ones. Well, I mean, I should I should say that, that shellac in itself is a fantastic invention. Um, what is it that's so different about it? Yeah, it's a hybrid polish. And what it means is that that you put the polish on, it doesn't alter the natural nail at all, but it doesn't come off. Mm -hmm. It lasts for 14 days, and that is just incredible. Yeah. I mean, our, our, our clients are all, all, all over are just going mad because at the end of the day, it's not going to chip. <laughs> And that's the problem with polish, isn't and that's it? True. So that's yeah. absolutely true. Yeah, because yeah. I'm quite hard on yeah. my nails, and, yeah. and it really does. Last. Yeah, for one, you can actually pretty much do the dishes, do your housework, do everything, and your nail polish is that's still right. on. So this one here, how fabulous! What okay, is this one? so I mean, this would be an example of uh, this is called a rock star nail, and uh, this is a sort of a bronzy gold colour. So there's shellac in here, but there's also glitter, which is what I'm wearing on yeah. on my own nails as well. Beautiful. So that's just to let, let you see the colour and the, the real sort of sparkle. Over Christmas, these were really popular. But Fantastic. in actual fact, people are still wanting them. Yeah. I thought it might just be a Christmas thing, but no. Lovely. I mean, this, this would be... I mean, you might be able to see just, just from Vivian's nails itself that the high, high shine that you get with shellac, shellac and I think that's... I think that's what's so good about wonderful, it. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So, I mean, there's another example of just a different sort of tone the real sort of richness and high shine. So is that sort of more of an aubergine, would you yeah, say? Yeah, yeah, that's an aubergine. I like that colour. Yeah, yeah, it's really like nice. It's really, yeah. really nice. And it looks particularly good on shorter nails, I think, the yes. darker colours. I mean, there's another sort of real sparkly, that's the sort of metallic blue. But it's got I mean, a young colour, do you think? It's young and they're showstoppers. Yeah. You know, everywhere you go, someone will say to you, oh, look at your nails, yeah. aren't these fantastic? Oh, wow. And then just on my own nail, there's the, the example of putting... Um, bows, we've got yeah. bows and hearts and all sorts of things that you can do now, but nails are moving forward, it's big, 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 big business. Now, you've brought, what, what's this you've brought in as well? Okay, well this is another great product and I, I know that this is talked about a lot, is the difference between if you're wearing a foundation, whether you use mineral makeup or whether you use like a cream foundation. And I thought it might be quite interesting just to see how these are applied and what a mineral makeup does. I mean, the bottom line is that everything that is in this little pot here is pure. 
Yeah. It's just basically ground rock. That's what it is. So there's there's nothing nasty. There's it's no very nasties. Light, isn't it? There are no nasties in here, and I think that actually does matter to mm -hmm. people. So I mean, to use one of these products, what you would do is just shake the, shake the pot, and basically what is in the lid is all you need to use. Okay, and there is a special type of brush. So what you do is you take your brush, and the minerals adhere themselves to the brush. So you swirl the brush through and then any excess you just tap it off yeah. and then to apply this, obviously you apply it to your face, but yeah. I'll just demonstrate it on my hand and to apply it you actually buff the product into the skin and it gives the most gorgeous Let's have glow. A look. Oh that is, that's so smooth. It's smooth and it gives a gorgeous, I mean if you could see someone without any makeup on at all and then with a dusting of this foundation, the difference is amazing. Yeah, a nice healthy look. Oh, it's absolutely gorgeous. And if you like to feel quite natural with your makeup, it is fantastic. If you like to feel like you've really got your makeup on, then you just reapply it and you just build it up from there. Fantastic. So, I mean, there's, there's some fantastic... Wonderful. I mean, I, I could show you a different one every week, literally. There's always something new on the market. That is lovely. Fabulous. Well, thank you so much, Charlie, for coming in. I know you're so busy. Not at all. It's a pleasure. I really loved that. And there's so much out there and uh, new products to it's try. It's exciting. It is. It's really, really, it's really exciting. exciting. And I hope you'll come back again soon. I'm and sure. And have another chat with us about what's I'd be happening in Hail Beauty. Delighted. <laughs>at the moment, Gavin, um, we're living very much in a very much celeb-inspired um, environment. People are watching The Only Way Is Essex and buying the magazines. Everybody wants to look like their favourite celebrity. So what better to, to bring that to Perth and give ladies opportunity to look like that? So if you come into us, we'll give you the complete look from the clothes to the tan to your eyelashes to accessories. Fantastic. So, I mean, every in that kind of new fashion culture, everybody is looking to keep up with the trend. So there's always there's always different trends every season. I know there is in fashion generally, but I think it's very much so with this whole new fashion look. Um, so can you can you talk through what what you see out in the market at this point in time, and and specifically what you're seeing you're bringing into Perthshire as well? Of so, course, Gavin. So, so so let's start off then. Well, obviously we've just come past <laughs> London Fashion Week, so it's the perfect time to talk about the key trends. Uh, this season is all about prints, it's animal prints, it's leopard print, it's swallows, it's swans, you name it, it's there. But one of the key looks this season is florals. Um, so from uh, perennials to strong blooms, there's such a, a mixed bunch out there. And that was seen on the catwalk in Valentino and Sportsmax. Uh, you'll see that coming through to our customer in Mac and Posh in the likes of Love, some beautiful floral dresses coming through and some really cute little tea dresses from uh, Miss Patina. Must have shorts from Maggie Me. Um, bolder the better, Gavin. Wow. I know you'll love that. <laughs> you'll love that. Um, also, we've got a fabulous label called um, Sugar Hill, which is favoured by the likes of the Saturdays and the girls of uh, the Only Wees Essex, Sam and Billy. Um, and they've just brought out a beautiful range uh, inspired by English Garden. So little bunny prints and cute carousel print dresses with little Peter Pan collars. So all very cute coming through this season. Fantastic. Garden. So, you know, uh, from, from what I understand, um, typically in, a, in, in any fashion season, in any, in any year, there always seems to be a retro look, whether that's the, the, the 60s or the, the 70s or, or the 80s or whatever. Have we, have we got a theme or a retro theme coming through this season? You're going to love this one, Gavin. Flirty 50s. It's <laughs> all about vintage glamour. The flirty 50s. So flirty, flirty, 50s. flirty 50s. Just imagine uh, Grace Kelly, Audrey Hepburn. Oh, right, OK. So very glamorous, but with a, a contemporary twist this season. Uh, think prom faced, um, nipped in little waist, um, foolish skirts, perfect for somebody like myself that's got the, the pear shaped. Um, you'll see this coming through to our customer, again in a fantastic label with stocking called Love, uh, got some gorgeous little chiffon and leaf dresses 
and also we've got some beautiful dresses coming through from a brand called Hedonia, um, bustier dresses and floral prints. Perfect, absolutely perfect look for this season's races, Gavin. Great. And I hear there's a, the next trend is there's a little bit of a, a, a water theme coming through for spring. <laughs> Gavin, it wouldn't be spring if it wasn't for nautical. Um, and who better to do it on the catwalk than Yves Saint Laurent? Mm. Uh, they've just launched the resort collection. Um, which was a mix of uh, Breton stripes, anchor prints and just Riviera chic. So what can I say, let's bring on spring Gavin, bring it on. Um, again you'll see this coming through in Sugar Hill. Uh, we've got a mix of palazzo pants, ahoy prints and some really cute striped knitwear coming through. And the, the little sailor's hat the as well. Sailor's hat. We'll <laughs> leave that for you Gavin, we'll leave that one for you. So um, colour wise, you know, it, it changes every season. Um, you can go from chocolate brown to, to bright reds or whatever. What's, what do you see the, because I suppose it's a bit dependent, the, the, the colour um, trend with the grads, your location and weather and things as well. So, so what do you see as being the sort of the hot trend in, in, in Perthshire? Well Gavin, please don't do chocolate brown this season. It's all about pastels this season. It's it's not so much about the brights and it's about keeping your shades to icy shades, not sweet sticky shades, um, so such as your mint green, uh, your corals, your sharper your sharper shades coming through um, and that was very much a wash on the likes of Dolce & Gabbana, mm -hmm. Louis Vuitton and Dior. Uh, we'll be bringing this through to our customer um, in some really sexy little shift dresses from Hybrid and the likes of the mint, she mint shades and lemon. Also some really cute little dresses coming through from Sugar Hill in some prints. And we also have some amazing um, asymmetrical maxis coming through from Love. Um, and what that is, it's high at the front um, and low at the back. Right. Okay. So something a little bit different. And, and very much a, a head to toe look. Head to toe look, keeping it all the one colour. Colour. Um, one of the key trends for this season is mixing coral and mint together, one of my personal favourites coming through from Sugar Hill. So it's, it's the real sort of cool, classy lady yeah. look. So hope to see some pastels next time, <laughs> Gavin, not so, right. Certainly not the florals, anyway. No. The <laughs> um, but you know, so sometimes Tracy people aren't in a position that they can go out and buy a whole new wardrobe, um, or they maybe don't have the time to do it either. So what, what kind of stuff's coming through where somebody can quickly and almost instantly take what they've got, add something to it and, and feel like they're, they're, they're hitting happening? It's a good question, Gavin. Um, obviously, at this time, uh, it's not quite summer, but we're coming out of winter, thankfully. Weather's improving. Mm. <laughs> so, I uh, know, fingers crossed. <laughs> uh, so, an instant way to update your wardrobe is to go with a slogan tea. Uh, this is favoured by the likes of Viana, uh, Alexa Chung, Nicola Roberts. Um, and they're great pieces. You can fling them on with your leggings, your maxi skirt, your skinny jeans. Um, it's just a, an instant, quirky way to update mm. your wardrobe. Uh, we've got th that coming through in two ways. You can have a bit of a rock chick look with delicious couture uh, and slogans such as wild thing uh, <laughs> and rock loves me. And also then you go to the cute side and you've got um, Brat and Susie uh, slogans such as smitten with kittens and uh, pigs, pops, piglets and kittens. Puppies, piglets Puppies. and kittens. You've obviously heard all about it, oh, Gavin. You're keeping doing, up with I've the trends. Doing, I've been doing my homework in the London Fashion League. Puppies, Very piglets impressed. and kittens, yeah. I believe. But I think, I think we'll keep to the, um, the, the wild thing. I quite actually. like the wild thing. I'll make sure you get one of them, Gavin. <laughs> so, um, and, you know, I, I always understand that one of the key accessories for any, for any lady or any girl is, um, is the fashion accessory, is the handbag. Now, you know, looking at some of the celebs and the celebrity magazines, my goodness, some of the handbags that they were lurking around with were, were bigger than them themselves. So, is, is the big chunky suitcase, glitzy, bling look still, still the hip thing moving forward? A woman always needs her essential handbag and us women do carry a lot of things around with us, Gavin, but this season it's about structuring it a bit, a bit calmer. Um, essential look is the doctor's bags back again, so quite structured, and also the satchel which has been favoured by the likes of Mulberry and Louis Vuitton. Um, and also chain handles are back in the season and who can forget the iconic Chanel who st started that trend. Um, we'll bring that to our customer uh, with a fabulous brand called Mark B. Uh, we have like the classic Knightsbridge which is very much the iconic Chanel kind of style bag with the chain handle. Um, we've also got a great barrel bag coming through that's quilted from um, uh, called Madrid in a putty colour, which is the essential bag, goes with everything for the mm -hmm. season. Also some cute little clutches coming through with butterfly details, so calming it down a little bit, Gavin, but 
handbags are essential for a girl. Of course. So moving back to the business, Mac and Posh, you're opening up, what, in, in, around mid-March time? Another couple of weeks, Gavin, yeah. And good location? Fantastic location, key location on the high street, so watch this space, it is coming, we Fantastic. are coming. Fantastic, well listen, all the best. Thank you very and, much, um, Gavin. We hope to see you back in the studio again sometime soon. As you said, it's coming up for racing season, so maybe you can pop back in and give, give some of the girls some tips for um, Ladies Day fashions. My pleasure, Gavin, look forward to Tracy, it. Tracy, thanks for your time. Thank you. There is no doubt that when it comes to fitness, there is so much different advice out there and so many different opinions that it's quite difficult to sort out the myths from the facts. So I'm delighted to welcome our resident fitness expert, personal trainer Stephen Clark, who's going to help us with this. So welcome Stephen, nice to have you again. Thanks Vivian. So the first question we've got, which is a very common view, that weight training turns fat into muscle. Now, is that a myth or a fact? That is a myth. I'm afraid. Right, because I, I honestly thought that was a fact because you do see, you know, the muscle there when people are weight training. <laughs> um, it's, it's obviously when people train, the, it's a mixture of losing fat and gaining muscle. Um, the fat doesn't actually turn to muscle itself. But you can see why people think that, you know, but as you're going through um, any sort of training, whether it's weight training or, or cardio, you will lose body fat. Um, and the, the muscle will start to show through, so you can see why people do believe that that fat turns to muscle. Yeah, because it can look quite dramatic, can't it? The, yeah, the changes, definitely. Yeah, and that's just the, the fat really melting away and, and you see the muscle more. Yeah, I mean, obviously, fat is a source of energy, so the more you train, the more you burn fat. Um, and what you see on the outside is obviously um, just kind of fat, fat under the skin. So as that starts to be used as energy, um, it gets smaller and smaller and then whatever is underneath starts to show through yeah. and that's the, the muscle and the more muscle tone you have the more the more it will show Very through. Good. Excellent, well I'm glad I wore long sleeves today. <laughs> um, so now another question which is kind of following on from that, that a lot of ladies feel that they don't want to do heavy weight training because they're frightened that they'll bulk up. Now is that a fact or a myth? Okay, um, a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, Weight training can be used for many different things. If a female did want to bulk up, then weight training would be the way to do it. But that is down to the, the individual program. Uh, I mean, I, I work with a lot of my clients with weight training, but you work it in a certain way that you don't bulk up. Um, if you stick to high repetitions um, and light weights, then you, you can gain the muscle tone, but it won't gain any size. It just tones the muscle, makes the muscle firmer uh, and more active but definitely not, you won't bulk up unless that's a desired goal and you go about a specific programme. Right, so, so for bodybuilders to get that shape that they get, it's quite hard, well it's really hard work, oh, isn't definitely. it? Definitely, it, it requires serious weight training and a lot of food, uh, especially for females. The, the hormone testosterone is very important, that's why uh, males find it easier to, to bulk up and, and get a little bit more muscle. Okay. So with females, you're more oestrogen. You do have testosterone, but you're a lot more oestrogen in your body. That's what I was going to say that to you. Is that why it's difficult for women to bulk up? It is, yes, yes. It's all to do with hormones. But if you lift heavy enough weights and eat enough food, then you can bulk up. But it's silly to think that any female could go on and a little bit of weight training is going to give them big muscles because if you look at female bodybuilders, they work for serious hours in the gym and yeah. they eat a lot of food to get like that, so uh, that's a well, it's not a complete myth, but um, as long as you're sensible about it and, and get a, a, a professional program designed for you, then you won't bulk up. So, so women shouldn't be frightened of from Definitely not, definitely okay. not. So it's something that they should do, really? Yes, yes. yes. Right. Okay, <laughs> well, the next question we've got um, is doing a lot of ab crunches will get rid of belly fat. So this is a good one. So is that a fact or a myth? All those, all those ab crunches I've been <laughs> um, Muscle activation burns fat, uh, and, and that is, that, that's, that's fact. However, the ab muscles are quite small in comparison to leg muscles, bum muscles, even the chest and back. They're quite a small muscle group. So in a way, yes, doing crunches will burn fat, but not as much as other muscles. But a point to note here right. is as muscles work, the muscle shortens. Now, the more muscle work you do on a particular muscle, it will actually become shorter unless you do specific stretches to, to prevent that from happening. Now, a lot of people go wrong here because they crunch too much. 
You know, people think, I want a flat stomach or I want a toned stomach. So all they do is crunch, crunch, crunch. And all that happens is you actually become shorter in the midsection and you actually pull your ribs closer to your hips. And if anybody does that now while you're sat at home, if you sit forward, you automatically, it looks like you're a little bit fatter around the, the waist. So crunches can actually give you the, the illusion of more fat. What they want to do is extension exercises to lengthen the stomach a little bit more. Okay. This makes me want to sit up a bit straight. Yes, you should. <laughs> right, okay. So, let me see. The next question is that working out on an empty stomach burns more fat. Fact or myth? That is fact. Right. If, okay. if, if your body good. doesn't have carbohydrates uh, in, in its system, then if you go for a, a, a slow, steady run, you will actually burn more fat. However, there's always a however. <laughs> I'm talking about a, a gentle jog, and if it was, if it was a mission to, to burn as much fat as you could in one hour, then going for a jog on an empty stomach is the way to do that. However, I've never heard of anybody who just wants to burn as much fat. Never. It's about burning fat over an entire day, an entire week, an entire month. You know, and, and burning as much as you can for a desired result. Now, when it comes to fitness, you want as much energy as you can for your workout without over-consuming, um, again, that will lead to a kind of weight gain. So a little snack before training is always advised, so it gives you more energy to, to work out, which then leads on to um, increased fat burning over the whole day. Yeah, because you don't want to eat too much before you're working out. No, but no. on the other hand, if you're going, like, say you're going for a run, like a longish run, you do need energy. You do. But if you've eaten too much, then you're going to feel sick. You feel sluggish and you, you feel heavy and you, yes, you, you can actually feel sick with, uh, with too much food. But um, something like a banana, half an hour before um, a, a long run would be good energy, um, depending on how long this run is. Yeah. Um, but, you know... Uh, uh, I mean, a seriously long run, you'd need more than a banana, wouldn't you? You would, you would. If you're going for the likes of a half marathon, then you do what's called carb loading, uh, which is just increasing the amount of carbohydrates you have in your in your day-to-day -day. Um, work, work, working kind of meals, if you like, okay. um, and that would just give you sustained energy throughout the full run. Right. But that's meals before you go for a run. You know, I'm talking two days before you, you start increasing your your, your carbohydrate level, right. um, but don't have too much just before a run because it's, again, it's, it's going to make you feel heavy and sluggish. Right. Okay. And and I know it's important to eat well after you've trained as well, isn't it? Recovery is the most important thing about training. Um, there's no point in training unless you're recovering afterwards, and that's where a lot of people go wrong. People think, I'm going for a run, so I'm getting fitter. But exercise is actually catabolic to your body, so that means it breaks your body down, uh, and it also makes you weaker. It's the recovery afterwards that makes you stronger and makes you fitter. So a good recovery meal is, is paramount to, to your training. Okay, that's very good. Excellent, lovely. So, on to the next question. Um, no pain, no gain. <laughs> now, it rhymes, but is it true? Fact or um, Oh, that's a tricky one. No pain, no gain. Mm -hmm. That's a myth. That's mm -hmm. a complete myth. Because you've got to think, if you're training in a gym or out on a run and you, you pull something, you, you tweak a muscle or you drop a weight on your foot, it's painful. It doesn't mean that you're gaining anything. Right. Um, I mean, the, the main one is people out running. You know, you could pull a hamstring or you can even have like a twinge in your back and a lot of people will try and run through that, you know, thinking no pain, no gain, I've got to keep going here, but you'll actually do yourself more harm than good by carrying on. Yeah, so it depends what kind of pain it is then. We're not just sort of a, I've yes, had enough uh -huh. of this, this is a pain. Uh -huh. It's if you think you might have done something. That's right. Yeah. Um, but and, and on the same side of that, you've got to think, well, sometimes training, it is just muscle ache, it's you're tired, you're exhausted, and when it comes to that, no pain, no gain is, is, is a bit of a fact as well. You know, you've got to, you've got to push yourself through boundaries in order to, to kind of get fitter and, and achieve your, res your results that you want. So yeah, yeah, uh, okay. you've, you've got to go for it. Very good. Right, what have we got? We've got, um, you need to take supplements or protein shakes to get in good shape. Fact or myth? That's a complete myth. Right. Um, again, it's something I get asked all day, every day, what supplements do you take? Um, and I've got to admit, I do have a supplement, but it's a supplement to my diet. You know, you don't need it. I use it when I'm short on time, um, but in between clients or in between work, I'll have a, a quick maybe protein shake, maybe straight after training. It, it kind of 
it fuels the body a lot quicker. However, if I've got the time, then I would much rather have all my nutrients from food, um, from, from fruit and vegetables, from, from lean meats like chicken, turkey, uh, different fish. There's no need for supplements if you have a balanced diet. That's a complete myth. Right, well, that's very good, that's very interesting. So, now, the last myth or fact we've got is if you're not working up a sweat, you're not working hard enough. This sounds like me. Fact <laughs> or myth? Uh, again, it's a complete myth. Glad to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's um, cooling system, which is what sweat is, um, works at different levels. Now, if I can give you an example, when I was in the forces, me and my friend Larry um, were about equal fitness, you know, and the, the test that we done was a mile and a half run. Now, we'd always compete. Every, every week we'd compete, you know, who, who could kind of win it? And we'd always finish. And sometimes I would win, and sometimes Larry would win, and it was always kind of a bit of fun competition. But when we finished, I was soaked. You know, I, my T-shirt was soaked, everything about me. And I looked around at Larry, and he's bone dry. Fresh as a daisy. Fresh as a daisy. That's Larry. However, sometimes I would finish before him and he was trying his hardest. So, it, sweat is yeah. um, down to the subject range. It's up to you. Um, everyone is different when it comes to sweat. Good. That's good. Right. Keep that in mind next time I'm training with you. Um, so, now we've got some viewers' questions. So, thank you so much for sending these in and keep them coming. Um, so, Stephen, we've got a few of these for you. So, Shannon from Bridge of Erin has just had a baby a couple of weeks ago. Congratulations. That's great. And she would like to know how safe is it to go back to the gym? How soon can she go back uh, to the gym to get back into shape? Okay. I'm surprised she's got energy to get her trainers on. <laughs> With pregnancy uh, and having babies, the, the guidelines say three months. However, I would always say speak with the midwife. Speak with your doctors and um, ask for advice from them because they will know you individually. Now, the, the, kinda, the, the books, three books on, on exercise say about three months. So use that as a guideline, but always check with your midwife to make sure that you personally are okay to exercise. Yeah, because I suppose it is personal. It does depend it on the circumstances, I mean, what type of birth, problems, that kind of thing. I've not had much experience in that field myself, but uh, um, I guess there's lots of ladies who, who can experience it talk from experience with that yeah. um, and everyone is different you know people go through so much um, and you have to work on an individual basis. Because do you find with your clients that there is a lot of pressure on people to get back into shape as quickly as possible? Because well, let's is. face it the media they do put a lot. Of the media and the celebrities they say you know look how quickly so and so has got back in shape after, after giving yeah. birth and it does put a little bit of pressure on um, but also encourages people because again people can use pregnancy and having babies as a bit of an excuse yeah. not to exercise. You know, I've had the kids, you know, I can't get back in shape. Of course you can. Mm -hmm. You've just got to work hard at it. But you've got to be sensible at the same time. Don't go back into it too soon. You know, let your body recover appropriately um, and then seek professional advice to just kind of take that forward and, and how to progress with it. Good. Excellent. Lovely. Now, our next question is from Amanda and Craigie, and I thought this was a really interesting one because she would like to know what your opinion is, Stephen, of kettlebells. Now, a lot of people might not know what kettlebell is, so tell us. A kettlebell is one of these. Right. Basically, what do you, do with that? you have got a, it's like a cannonball with a handle. Right. Okay, and ultimately that's what it is. It's one of the the oldest pieces of exercise gear around. Um, it dates back to uh, Russia, I believe it started. Um, great piece of kit. And why, why is it so good? It's very functional. You, you train, um, I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no cables, there's no moving parts. It is just a weight. Um, and it's very, very good for, for developing power, for developing muscle tone. Um, you can do sports-specific training with it um, or just kind of aid weight loss. Right, so do you use this quite a lot with your clients? I, I do, I do. I use it on a weekly basis. Um, not with everyone, it's not suited to everyone, but um, it is good for, for a lot of clients and a lot of different types of training. Very good. Well, there you are. Well, that's really good because it's sometimes quite nice to do something a little bit different as well, isn't it? Because when people are in the gym a lot, you can get a little bit and, and that's up. And that's why it's popular. You know, People go from um, fixed machines and cables and a mat or an exercise class um, and it can get a little bit um, boring, boring. Yeah. Um, and 
that's adding something different to your workout or to your routine can um, have dramatic effects, you know, for your body as well as your mind, you know, you just, you feel a, a kind of new sense of kind of energy because yeah. you're doing something different and it's, uh, it's, it's great for... And they them. come in different weights, don't they? They so do. I mean, you this is to start off with a really heavy one. This is five kilograms. You can get a lot lighter and you can get a lot, lot heavier. Right. Um, so, again, if you're thinking about doing some sort of kettlebell training, speak to a qualified instructor right. um, and they can advise you on the, the appropriate technique to use as well as which um, weight of kettlebell to use. Good, very good. Well, I hope that was helpful, Amanda. That was a good question. Now, our final question, our final viewer's question is from someone who didn't want to give their name and describes themselves as young, handsome and lives near the North Inch. Well, wonder who that could be. And Come he in. wants to know how many packets of salt and vinegar are you allowed when you're on the Waistline Online Challenge? And the answer <laughs> is, Stephen? Gavin, none, none. I'm afraid. <laughs> What is he like? <laughs> so, thank you once again for your informative advice, Stephen. That was very good. We no really problem enjoyed at all. It. Thanks and for I having me. I always learn something new when you come in, so it's great. And if you would like any of your fitness questions answered or want some advice from Stephen, then please feel free to get in touch at the usual details here at Perthshire Online or with Stephen Direct at info at stephen clark.com. Well, thank you for joining us again this week and thank you for all your support. And remember, we always want to hear from you. We want to hear your news, your stories, your events. Get in touch with us in the normal channels. You can either email us at info at personalonline.co.uk. You can message us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter as well. We'll see you next week.